the transition is def it's definitely doable, um, but it is a different pace. And what would you tell somebody thinking about any, any transition? Like what? Definitely go for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it. I was at a television station for 22 years, and I was comfortable. I mean, that's like putting on your old favorite pair of jeans every day and going in and, and just doing the same thing. And, you know, um, and I like to think that I was relatively good at it. I had good days and bad days. And so when you first approached me, it was huge for me to, that was a scary thing. I mean, I'll be honest, you know, it was like, do I do this? You know, uh, what if it falls apart? You know, what if this doesn't work out? And, but you know, um, you, I don't, I didn't want to look back on my life and go, if I had only, if I had only. And so I chose to, to take that leap you know, again, and, and it was scary, but in the same sense, it was easy because I had worked with you for nine of those 22 years at Channel 3. You and I knew each other, uh, and I was very flattered that you thought of me out of the hundreds of photogs you could have uh, called up. And for all I know, I was your third or fourth choice. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. Hey, welcome to the Storytellers Network podcast. I'm so glad you're listening today because today it gets a little bit personal. Uh, in this episode, I get to talk to a storyteller that I've had the opportunity to work with over the years. From the newsroom to the marketing department, Bill Krupka and I have collaborated maybe a few times. <laughs> Bill spent 22 years at a CBS affiliate in a top 40 TV market as a photojournalist. We worked together there. I was there for nine years. Uh, this guy's interviewed heads of state. He's covered and told the stories of tragedy, triumph, and everything in between. Then he came to work with me in marketing, helping hopeful home buyers navigate their experiences. Uh, and today, Bill becomes the subject. <laughs> it's a title he's not always willing to put on, but he does so for us in order to share with the Storytellers Network his storytelling craft, his experiences over the years, and tips for you as a storyteller. In other words, Bill shares his story. And just before we get to there, remember to look us up online at the storytellersnetwork.com. If you're on Apple Podcasts or somewhere else, you can find the website. You can uh, look at more episodes, other information, how to contact me. You can find other resources there to help you better tell your story. And hey, if you like what we're doing here at the Storytellers Network, please consider leaving us a review that helps us reach new storytellers. Now, let's get to the stories. <music> So thank you for joining uh, the Storytellers Network, Bill. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. I'm uh, a little surprised you wanted me, but uh, I'll take it anyway. Well, so I see you as a storyteller. I mean, so as I said in my intro, we've worked together. Uh, we've been friends for a long time. I consider you a storyteller of one of the purest forms when it comes to video especially. Uh, over 20 years experience as a photojournalist. So so to me, you're, you're a storyteller. It's no surprise there. Um, and, and you've worked you know, with, with a top 40 market CBS affiliate. You've worked smaller than that. You worked for the national guys, you know, as a as like a freelancer, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, and, and you made the transition from from news into marketing. So so don't don't be shocked. You're a storyteller. Um, do you consider yourself a storyteller? I do. I do. But you know, uh, and I know that uh, with your uh, with your podcast, you've been going through writers and various storytellers, and so I was never a strong writer. Um, and so when you think storytellers, you think books right away. Um, and I don't think people think as photojournalists as storytellers. Uh, you know, there's a, the old saying in news, photographers are to be seen and not heard. And uh, so I've always kind of felt that, you know, we're behind the scenes. Nobody knows who we are. We just kind of do our thing quietly. And we let the people in front of the camera get the recognition for what, what, 
what we do. Yeah. And that's cool because it is a it is a give and take. Reporters are just as much of a part of a story if you're working with one. So, But if there wasn't a photographer, mm-hmm. it'd just be radio. <laughs> this is true, right? This is true. <laughs> I mean, come well, on, and that's and that's only and that's only if the reporter took something to record it with. Oh yeah. <laughs> so so did, did where did that start for you then, Bill? Is, are you have you always told stories? Like is this is a family thing where you were the youngest, so you're always telling stories. Or I think it it, it actually started for me. Uh, I was I was always a gadget guy. Hmm. You know, I just loved t- technology and gadgets and. Uh, and I remember <clears throat> back in like 80, I don't want to date myself, but in the <laughs> 80s, uh, my dad uh, got his first video recorder. And it, that thing was huge, you know, and it used VHS tapes. Um, for all you listeners who don't know what that is, that's a <laughs> that's Mylar with a magnetic back. Eh, never mind. But uh, Google it, right? Yeah, Google. Google, Google VHS. Uh, <laughs> and so, I, you know, I just kind of like like that you know that technology and being able to record you know sound and audio and I actually when I was in college I took a couple of film classes too so <clears throat> but it did start when I was younger with the, with that video camera uh, that my father had purchased so let's talk about technology then um, well we'll get into other the other kind of normal questions but I want to chase this rabbit for a minute you talk about technology or gadget guy so uh, and I, and I, I'm setting you up because I know we talked about this privately as well, but I want I want to hear this. How does technology affect storytelling nowadays? Does it make it easier, better? Like it's a double edged sword. What do you? Yeah, it, it definitely is. It, it's 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 definitely uh, a double edged sword. It can be a beast. I, I think you know technology uh, cameras have become smaller uh, with high definition. Uh, the chips inside are, are much smaller. And so the uh, the quality of the images that are being captured are 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 much much better than the old tube cameras mm. where you didn't dare shoot a candle because you'd get burn in. Um, in the same sense, because of that technology, I think as storytellers we tend to rely on it too much, uh, and it's not as much as the cameras as it is with the nonlinear editing. Uh, in the old film days, film was expensive to shoot because it was expensive to process Mm. and it was time consuming. So in news, you don't storyboard anything. You can never ask the fireman, I'm sorry, I missed you putting that fire out. Can you relight it so I can get this cool shot? I mean, there's no, (laughs) there's no do overs in news, Yeah, you know? So you had to think quickly. You had to keep your head on a swivel. And you had to look for things that would help tell the story of what was going on. And so you still had to think, you don't just shoot and shoot and shoot with film. And then you have to take it back and you have to develop it and edit it. And I think now with technology, I can record over that hard drive. It's not a big deal. Hmm. I'm not, you know. So they just shoot so much, but is it thoughtful shooting? And I guess that's one of the things that my mentor... Art Charlton brought to me when I first got into news is I still shot film style. Uh, everything had a purpose. I don't just spray a bunch of video and hope that I got I captured some moments. Granted, you don't storyboard anything in news uh, because you can't. You just don't know what's going to happen. But uh, which is why I kind of feel like news photographers really the really good ones that are out there and there's plenty. Um, they do, you know. They keep their head on a swivel, and they usually will will have a reporter with them, who will also like, hey, look over here, over here, and to capture those moments that help tell those stories. So yeah, you know, technology is wonderful. Um, you know, I think you know with the equipment becoming lighter, uh, but in the same sense, I think it could be a crutch mm-hmm. for lack of of. Uh, good photojournalism mm-hmm. and, and that do you think that's kind of the same for every storyteller that you know that the easier the, the quote easier it becomes to tell a story the more we just kind of some some of us anyway become lazy i mean i mean you you i think you i think you definitely can become complacent yeah i have found i've even found myself i'm not immune to it i'm certainly not perfect and i know that there are a thousand 
hundred thousand photographers better than I out there. And you, but you do, you'd fall into that trap of, well, I know, I know my, I know my nonlinear editor can fix that. Right. I'm not too concerned, yeah. you know. And and I catch my even myself falling into that trap where no, go back to basics, you know, go back to the foundation of true, you know, photojournalism and shooting. Yeah, I, I've. I want to come back to something, too, in a minute here. You, you talked about having a reporter as a photojournalist. So we're going to come back to that partner thing, because um, I, th I find that fascinating. As a storyteller who I often work alone, what is it like collaborating? So we'll, we'll come back to that. But I want to know, first, though, staying on technology, you, you've seen, and I, I, won't, I won't date you either, um, first of all, because we're both married. No, I mean, like, time date. Um, <laughs> but uh, you've seen the change over the years. You know, you were in news for over 20 years, and marketing for, what, six years or whatever. You've seen a lot of technology come and go. Do you have a favorite technology change that has helped you become a better storyteller in some way? You know, um, I think you know. There's a couple of things with the cameras. The weight of a camera actually never bothered me. I know back in the day you had the old three quarter inch beta or three quarter inch deck, you know, and you had the umbilical cord and this, and you're lugging around 45, 50 pounds worth of equipment. And you had to balance it just right. And, um, you know, the average camera now, uh, you know, is probably hovering around 18 pounds. That kind of thing never really bothered me. Um, I actually like a bigger camera because it balances on your shoulder better. And your shots, you know, coming short of a steady cam, your shots can be, you know, if you're shooting off, off the shoulder because you're doing a walk and talk or movement, um, those, those shots are smoother. But you know, one of the I think one of the big things for for a lot of journalists or a lot of videographers is the invention of the wireless mic, mm -hmm. because <clears throat> having to stretch you know hundred foot XLR cables you know in a courtroom and when you're coming to trial, uh, and you have to tape it all down because you don't want anybody to trip. That's you know that's just a time vacuum. It just yeah, uh, and now. They walk up with a little pack that weighs less than two ounces, and they set that up on the judge's bench, and nobody's really the wiser. And, you know, then all you hope is that you put in fresh batteries. <laughs> <laughs> so wireless mics have really helped. Yeah. Um, but there again, the job was done all those years with wired microphones, hardwired microphones. And, and again, going back to the double-edged sword, wireless mics are great. They can help you become more efficient. But I've never had a microphone that was hardwired run out of power. Yeah. Because they draw their power from the camera. I've had plenty of wireless mics die in the middle of stuff. And uh, the batteries just didn't last. Uh -huh. And especially in Michigan, cold sucks battery power like nothing else on this planet. So, uh -huh. um, again, it's, again, you're dancing with the devil there with convenience of a wireless microphone versus... Is this power going to last for the entire time that you're doing whatever you're doing? Yeah. You know. What about uh, the advent of the cell phone and the drone? Like, how, how has that impacted <laughs> your storytelling? Well, as you know, I am a licensed drone pilot. And uh, um, drones, again, I look at drones as just another tool in the toolbox. Yeah. Like the wireless mic. Um, you know, I, I think if you utilize them well they can really help advance the story of what whatever story you're trying to tell and give your audience a unique perspective on things um but again i think where it can sometimes fail is if that's all you use is aerial video um you've lost so much more potential of what that story could be because we're only looking at it from one perspective um, I think drones are extremely uh, useful. Um, they're able to give you that viewpoint without a lot of cost. Uh, back when I first started, the only way we could get aerials in the news was call the guy that had a helicopter, pay him 250 to 300 dollars an hour to go get you know f two minutes worth of video of a you know of a scene. Um, and you know who we used to call. <laughs> call Phil. Yeah, call yep. Phil. And, uh, and then fly over his Christmas trees. Yep. Oh, and, uh, you know, uh, but now, you know, to send up a drone, um, yeah, it's so much more convenient. It makes you much more efficient. 
in your in, in depending on what scene you're going to in terms of news again I'm speaking uh, it makes you that much quicker to the scene before it's cleaned up of whatever it is yeah and, and I, I like the idea that it gives you different perspective like you know what I heard you say Bill was as you're telling a story you figure out the different sides of the story you want to tell whether it's news whether it's you know something more creative whatever you want to look at you can get different perspectives and that we used to not be able to as storytellers. So it really kind of, it can, in a sense, help you tell a better story. Oh, yes, most definitely. As long as it's not, it doesn't become like your only focus, right? Right, again, as long as it just doesn't become your crutch. Yeah. Is, is you know, I'll just go, uh, well, everybody likes drone video, so here, here's another aerial <laughs> shot. Yeah, n- n- yeah. Not, it's not necessarily, I, there's got to be a balance. And there's plenty of great stories that I have seen recently. You know, I the, the one thing that you and I have talked about before, before we even started all this, was I don't want to dog anybody. Yeah. There are tons of great storytellers out there, and I've seen a bunch of stuff lately that just blows my doors off. And they use that, there's a good mix of aerial and ground and sound, and, and that sound, again, is yeah. another thing that there are a lot of guys that are doing it, uh, but there's a lot of people who don't. And, and just that sound can really really drive home a, a feeling because you know let's face it whether it's a book or whether you're doing a podcast or whether you're doing a video you want people to be left with some kind of an emotion hmm. whether it's anger or happy or sad or in, empowered you want them in to to have some type of feeling and it, I net sound to, no matter where you are just to let it go and, and there's a story that you and I did actually together not that long ago when we were in marketing together where you know uh interviewing a father and he started to kind of choke up and then i didn't ask a question we just let it i just let it go and and, and it was you who said let it go even longer because he did go longer i could have cut it shorter but we let it go longer and it made that moment you know so there it is i mean and it was silence and you could hear him kind of choke up a little bit and you know, and he had big alligator tears welling in his eyes, and there was silence. You know, and it was just, and I could have cut that at any point, but you know, and I and I had shortened it, and you're like, "Hey, does that go longer?" And you know, I'm like, "Well, yeah." <laughs> we let it go longer, and look what happened. Yeah. And that was a great moment. Well, thanks, thanks for the accolades. Uh, I love working with somebody and telling a story. Those are some of my favorite times. At, at, back when we worked together, is those March of Dimes stories where we could tell that family story and have that mom or dad talk about their kid, have them just like, like, cause you know, marketing's fun, but mortgages aren't the best <laughs> always. Right? right. But telling those family stories was, was fun. So yeah. on that, like thinking about interviews, I mean, you, you, you do, between working with reporters and doing it yourself as a, as a, so, as a single solo photojournalist, you've, I have no idea if you even can fathom how many people you've interviewed. <laughs> um, but, but but as you're telling a story, whether it's a documentary, whether it's um, a family story like that, whether it's actual like news, the art of the interview, how does that become part of storytelling? <clears throat> I think it, it's something that you learn. Um, some people may have it. I, I truly believe like one of the guys that I, I think is incredible at it is Steve Hartman. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, being able to ask <clears throat> the in phrase the the question to f- facilitate these response you're looking for is is an art form um and and it, and it is very powerful if you you know and, and you do develop that over time you know it's again one of those things of practice makes perfect you know you have to do you do have to do a lot of bad interviews <laughs> to get to to get to a good one and to know um how to phrase a question in a manner that it's going to give you the response you're looking for. And in news, you don't have a, a, a long time with people. You know, you have a couple of hours, and in many cases, uh, you know, maybe 20 minutes to sit down and talk with them. And if you're trying to grab some emotion out of them, you better, you better be able to know how to ask a question that's going to give them the response you want or that's really going to tell that story. And so I think interviewing, the art of interviewing is, is really important because, again, if, if you don't phrase your question right, you're just going to get a, yep, right. nope, yeah, sure. And I did that. I did a lot of that where I, I didn't think before I asked a question. 
You know, was this a was this a fun day? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, end of, end of story, I guess. You know, um, but over time, you learn to develop that ability to to ask the question to to get the response you're looking for. And if I'm a storyteller thinking about interviews and documentaries or whatever, and, and I'm thinking I want to get that out of people, what's a tip that you would give somebody how to put people at ease? You stick a camera in somebody's face, so many people kind of shut down or give you the, yep. What's a, what's, what is a, a trick or two that you used over the years to put people at ease? Um, I, I, had a, I had a phrase that I used to use all the time, and I still use it, actually. And it's like, you know, hey, I don't want you to be nervous. <clears throat> it's just you and I having a conversation. I mean, look, if I can do this, uh, anybody can do it. You know, and um, the other thing that I would do, and, uh, and, and it wasn't lost on me tonight uh, when you and I first started talking, is while I was setting up lights or tripod, I'm talking to them mm -hmm. and they're getting to know me. And I'm and I'm talking about you know yeah I've got three labs you know uh, I, I like to play soccer. Oh lab, yeah. lab dogs, not meth labs. Right, 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 yeah. right, 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 right. Free labs. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm certainly not a meth user. Look at me. Oh wait, you can't see me. So, um, but uh, you know I I start to just. Talk to them just about the mundane stuff. Hey, hot weather. Just get them to talk and get them more comfortable with you. Especially, in, and a lot of times in news and, and even in some documentaries, you're meeting people for the very first time, and you are. You're sticking this big camera in their face. You're putting some strong lights on them. And, you know, it kind of feels like a little interrogation. And so if you ask them just mundane stuff while you're setting up, they tend to, to relax more and and again don't be afraid to open up a little bit about yourself yeah i'm married and uh you know i've got the three dogs and uh oh you know oh i see that you've got you know uh you know, a fish on the wall oh did you did you catch that oh yeah i like the fish yeah you know and then just break the ice that way uh with people to get them to kind of relax and and i always tell them, look at me don't look at the camera it's just you and i having a conversation mm -hmm. and um and, and, you know, they, they'll start to open up. And just be human with them. Right, right. Saying, right. You don't have to put on a big facade for them. You know, they know that you're going to ask them questions that may or may not make them comfortable. And uh, they know it's coming. They just don't know when. And, again, I think that goes back to the art of interviewing is phrasing those questions so that they don't become completely unglued over them. Um, mm -hmm. I think emotion is great. Um but I don't think you want, like, if you're trying to get some tears, I don't think you want hysterical sobbing either. <laughs> right, right. What is, what's one of the most powerful interviews you've done, whether extremely positive or maybe very difficult? What's one that stuck with you over the years? Oh, man, there's a lot. There's a lot of strong. Obviously, the hard ones for me were, were in news, and it's usually when parents have lost a child. Hmm. And... Um, and to be able to just sit there and talk with them, and and it's what what's really hard is 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 listening to them talk hours after their child, and I don't and I always felt like part of me kind of felt like oh are we taking advantage of them like this is still like a shock thing, and they really don't know what they're doing, um, you know, and I we always try to at least I always try to approach this of look, unfortunately your son passed away and whatever the name your current tragic event a lot of people got cheated they didn't get to know who they were tell me about him tell me what he loved to do what was his passion and if you can get a mom or a father who's grieving to start to talk about their their son or daughter in that perspective um they don't just become a statistic on the news it make it humanizes them and and then it gives people an opportunity to know who they were because unfortunately they passed away in this tragic event and no one's ever going to get to know them and so this is their parents chance to to share what they knew about their son or daughter all along that nobody else will ever get to know and i always try to approach it that way and put parents at ease yeah. but the strength of parents that are able to do that is just mind-blowing that to have that kind of resiliency and to be able to do that so, so at that point, story becomes a healing 
arts. It becomes a connection point. You know, for those who, who watch the news and say, oh, I can't believe they stuck a camera in their face, like, those behind the scenes are most likely thinking what you're thinking and saying, okay, help you help bring you closure, help bring you something. So it's so story connects us is what I kind of hear. Yeah, well, most definitely, yeah. Of course, <clears throat> there's a lot of people who would watch the news and, oh, yeah, just what you said, a, lot, a bunch of vultures sticking a camera and how, do, how dare they bother those poor parents, you know. They obviously don't have a soul or don't have children of their own. And, and it, But at the end of the day, it is a job. And, and yeah, it, 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 I would like to think and hope, and I have had, had parents tell me, you know, at the end of it, you know, thank you. Thank you for understanding. And thank you for, for wanting to tell my son or daughter's story. Yeah. And that they just weren't another teen tragically killed because of whatever. Um, you know, it is. It helps them open up about it. And I, I, you know, and and I again, I'm not saying, you know, we we both know people who have lost children, and hmm. you know, they never get over it. But I hope that that at that moment, it, it makes them more comfortable in talking about it, yeah. in letting people know who they were, who they were, and what they were like. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, partnerships. Uh, I want to go back to that that we talked about earlier. You, as a photojournalist, you worked with reporters uh, and producers. And news directors, and everybody had a hand in the pot. <laughs> so, as a, as, a, as a storyteller, kind of to kind of to your core, what's it like working with somebody else? Do you have to go in with a mindset of this is a partnership? Like, how do you how do you navigate those waters? It, it when you're young, when you're a young journalist, and I, it doesn't matter if you're a reporter or, or a photographer side of it. When you go out on a story together, you each think it's my story. And, 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 and every young person, every young storyteller falls into this, at least in news. You know, the reporter and the photographer will clash at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the reporter's like, this is my story. The photojournalist is like, yes, but without my video, you don't have a story. And, 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 and you just go through this. I don't tell you how to write. Don't tell me how to shoot. <laughs> you know, and everybody goes through that. And, and it's okay. Uh... But what, as long as you remember that it is a partnership at the end of the day, and that you know it's okay to disagree, but you have to be able to do it professionally, and and at a certain amount of time in your in your profession, you realize that it is a partnership, and it's one that you need. Um, now, you know, especially if there's gaps in the story, a very good reporter can fill those in with the right words, and again. I look at somebody like Steve Hartman. Hmm. I mean, you he knows when to write and have his voice on his stories. And he knows when to just let, just to shut up and let the people tell their story. And then he adds his little snippets here and there that just push it over the edge of greatness. And I love the way Steve Hartman does that. Um, and so it is a partnership. And, uh, <clears throat> and it, again, as you become more mature in your storytelling you you do realize that you need you need that reporter to have your back and 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 good reporters realize that they don't have always have the best words either and and I uh, uh, we have a mutual friend who used to ask all the time hey Bill I'm stuck with this I need a line for this what can you help me with what do you have you know and she, but I'm like, I'm not, I'm not the writer. I, I just shoot the pretty pictures, remember? <laughs> you know, but, but she would ask, yeah. you know. And in the same sense, you know, hey, I thought you were going to put that shot of a uh, close-up of, of the statue there. Oh, all right. Well, let's try it and see what it looks like. Yeah. You know, it's a give and take. Because um, at the end of the day, the bo both of you are just trying to do one thing, tell the best story you can. And when you walk away with a great product, it's it's such a... A thing that brings you together. Oh yeah. You know, so I I heard you say that it it, it happens. It's okay. Uh, you both have passion, and so you used to tell me something all the time is when when I stop caring, and I don't fight back, that's when things are bad. Oh yeah. Right. When so, I when I get quiet. Yeah. Uh, if I stop talking, or I stop making suggestions, worry. Yeah. Because that means I've checked out. I'm no longer invested in this project. Um. Because I've hit a point where we're not we're not seeing eye to eye, and and it's gone a little bit south. And yeah. so, if I've given up, 
um, that's usually not a good sign, you know. Uh, but as long as I'm talking and as long as I'm questioning, are you sure you want to say this? I used to say that to a lot of reporters. I'd get a script after the fact and they'd go to start to edit the video. And I'm always like, oh, are we sure we want to say this? Because that's not how I took it, you know. And as long as you do it, in a, again, in a professional manner, it's okay to disagree on things. But you do need to, to find a happy medium and, you know, and meet in the middle someplace where then, you know, because the news goes on at 6, not 6.01. And so you can't have these discussions for hours. Yeah. You can't like, well, we'll pick this up tomorrow. You know, let's just walk away and cool off. No, you got to, when you're sitting in a live truck in the middle of nowhere in a snowstorm, you don't have hours to discuss this. So you yeah. do have to come to a conclusion in a timely manner. I love the idea of, of, of working with somebody again, you know, going back to that. I just, I think it's cool to, two heads are better than one, you know, and if you can give and take, that's so important. I, I have had the, the fortunate ability to work with some very, very talented writers, uh, that, well, I consider very talented writers, yeah. you know, Judy Marquis, um, uh, John Coke, Lee Cowan, who is currently with CBS yeah. News, uh, you know, some very talented writers, you know, Ed Kingersky, who you and I both worked with, um, you know, I, I did some work with Terry Okita with CBS News. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Again, you know, very talented writer. Um, and so having that, you know, having those people to watch to see how they did things. You know, I used to always say I would love, you know, one of my... Uh, one of my bucket lists probably would still be to, to shoot one story with Steve Hartman. Yeah. You know, to just go and shoot a story with him to see how he operates behind the camera. My goal is to get him on the podcast this season. We'll see. Oh, that would be I'm awesome. Still, I'm still working on that it. That would be awesome to have Steve Hartman. Oh, yeah. Well, and I think, and I think the, the cool thing, so what, what Steve makes me think of is, obviously he's a video storyteller. He's a reporter. He, he he's, he's new, so he's video, but... Like, I could probably sit and read something that he just wrote. Right. You know, or something that he just talks about, maybe on like a podcast, because he's a storyteller, not just a, a video guy. Right. right. And that's why, you know, that's why I, the way I see you, that's why I see all my storytellers that we've had on the show. But, but yeah, Steve would be great. See, I, I always had a saying, you know, I had a face for radio, voice for newspaper. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just did my thing. And, uh, but yeah, Steve Hartman and, and some of those guys that, uh, are just incredible storytellers, you know. And it's not just news. I mean, you mentioned Ed, you mentioned John Coke. Um, well, sports, like sports. Yeah, telling a great sports story and covering a great sports story. Um, you know, I, I, I posted something just today on Facebook. I came across an old credential. And, and you know, there's a lot of parts of news that <clears throat> people have asked me about. Oh, don't you miss it? And and there are, there are a lot of aspects of news that I am glad that that is behind me. Um, but there are some parts of, the, of news that I, I did enjoy, and they were still work. And, um, and, and, but it is those relationships that you build with somebody. And, uh, and I mentioned Ed Kingersky because he was in my post today that I put on Facebook, and, and uh, we had covered the first, uh, the big chill at, at U of M in the big house. And it was a busy day, and I ran around the entire stadium with the camera. And then I was all hot, and then we went into the press box, and it's, you know, 90 degrees in there, and so now I'm all sweating, and, and I'm trying to edit our story. You know, it was a busy day, but it was fun, you know, and it wasn't a murder. It wasn't a, you know, a house fire where somebody lost all their present. It was a fun story of Michigan and Michigan State playing the first outdoor hockey game at the big house, and it was a great time, And but it was still work, but it didn't seem like work because... It was fun, and, and and I knew that I was working with somebody that I respected. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, so uh, you, you talk about you missing that, so you're not in news anymore, obviously. Former photojournalist. What interested you in going from the news area into marketing? You know, when, when I when I reached out to you and said, hey, I got this position, man, I think you'd be great for it. What was it that, that really tripped your trigger to go into marketing? Again, it was the... Yeah, I, I remember the day. In fact, it, what's funny is because I and I don't delete my phone very often. I still have that original Twitter message you sent me, <laughs> uh, and I don't know why. Uh, and that's like a couple of phones now. But um, 
it, it was the ability when you when you first approached me, in, and I'm thinking mortgages really. Um. Right, okay. Well, later on we'll be watching paint dry and grass grow, uh, <laughs> which we did. Which and other, but anyway, we did, but, uh, home improvements and yard <laughs> right, yard tips, right? right? right. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah. Which paint dries faster? Uh, next <laughs> on on your YouTube channel coming to you. Um, but it was still the the you know what you had mentioned to me was you know we want to tell a homeowner's story, and I think that. We we did pretty good. I think there was there's still, in my opinion, some ground that is untouched in terms of, of that. But that 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 journey of homeowners getting that first I mean, let's face it, the American dream is home home ownership and having that little piece slice of American pie, you know, Americana. Being able to just uh, you know, have the white picket fence and the dog and and uh you know, let's face it, for most individuals, you know, purchasing a home is the biggest thing they're ever going to buy. And so what's that journey like? What's that all about? And is it, you know, how's that process? And I always, you know, and you and I have talked over the years, I think people tend to gravitate toward people who are in the exact same positions that they are, you know, and so they can really understand it. Like, you know what, that's me. That's me. I don't really have a ton of equity. I've never bought a home. What's it like? How do I even get pre-approved? You know, and so telling those stories, and let's face it, with the technology today and the internet, uh, people really want to be visually stimulated than read a book, you know. Um, you know, that's why you see so many companies making video manuals now, you know. Oh, pop in this DVD to learn how to assemble your DVD recorder. How does that work? <laughs> but you know, <laughs> but but you know what I'm saying is, yeah. you know, instead of just a booklet with with really bad drawings, here's a DVD that's going to show you how to do it. You know, and you can Google still. You can go to YouTube, and you can watch videos on how to, to just about do anything. And so, people want to see that and tell, and they want to hear. What, what is it like to get pre-approved? What are they going to ask me? You know, and it, it could be a scary thing. And and I thought, you know, what you and I did in, you know, uh, five years, uh, we did we did a pretty good job of, I think, educating some some current and, and future home buyers because, you know, that stuff's out there still uh, for people to view. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and, and they're not all glitz and glam. You know, they're not they're not shiny. They're not they're not Pixar. They're not uh, Lord of the Rings. They're not Avatar. They're just basic stories of people getting their first home, yeah. and and answering questions that home buyers, future home buyers, or you know may or may not have. And how and how was that transition for you as a, as a storyteller who's out there right now, maybe listening, thinking, okay, I want to go from this to that, but it's scary. How how is the transition going from one kind of storytelling to another? It, it can be difficult. Um, there's a there's a growing pain. Uh, there's uh, the life of a of a of a photojournalist in news is much more run and gun, much more fast paced, um, and so things going into the marketing world slowed down tremendously. You know, um, and I was not, you know, I was not used to not completing a project at the end of the day you know i would and, and and you and i both worked at the same television station together you knew that a lot of times a photographer and a reporter would put on something for noon at live at noon and then a package for five a package for six and you were live and you had to set up the live trucks and all of that where you transition into marketing storytelling and telling homeowner story there's no time, you know. This story doesn't have to be on YouTube by six, you know. So, you know, and and uh, you have a you have the ability to plan, um, and it was it's still difficult for me because I I still want to go into it thoughtfully, but I also don't want to, you know. We've talked about storyboards together in the past too, and you know that I don't storyboard anything right. because. And even in my own mind, I think, oh, I got a storyboard. I got to stick to that. And I know that you don't, 
But I just, I don't want to go into a story with any preconceived notions of, I'm going to shoot this, I'm going to shoot that, I'm going to shoot that. As a photojournalist in news, you show up on a scene, you have to quickly assess what's going on, and then start shooting your video thoughtfully. And that's what how I like to approach it for me. That's what works best for me, is to just kind of go in open-minded and, and, and pick out the snippets that I think are going to tell that story. And so, again, going back to the marketing aspect, it was a slower pace. Um, I still shot the same, um, and uh, I was still a pretty quick editor. And I remember the first couple of months I was there, you're like, oh, you're done with that? <laughs> yeah, I'm done. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. You know, I didn't need this today. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and again, so the transition is def it's definitely doable, um, but it is a different pace. And what would you tell somebody thinking about any, any transition? Like what? Definitely go for it. I mean, let's face it. I was at a television station for 22 years, and I was comfortable. I mean, that's like putting on your old favorite pair of jeans every day and going in and, and just doing the same thing. And, you know, um, and I like to think that I was relatively good at it. I had good days and bad days. And so when you first approached me, it was huge for me to, that was a scary thing. I mean, I'll be honest, you know, it was like, do I do this? You know, uh, what if it falls apart? You know, what if this doesn't work out? And, but you know, um, you, I don't, I didn't want to look back on my life and go, if I had only, if I had only. And so I chose to, to take that leap you know, again, and, and it was scary, but in the same sense, it was easy because I had worked with you for nine of those 22 years at Channel 3. You and I knew each other, uh, and I was very flattered that you thought of me out of the hundreds of photogs you could have uh, called up. And for all I know, I was your third or fourth choice. I don't know. <laughs> that's, for the, for, that's for the record, no. <laughs> and that's fine. You're you know, tenth. Actually, you were 10th. Yeah, no. exactly. Uh, you were my last resort. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you, you had worked with a lot of talented journalists that were still in the area, and that still are in the area, that you could have called. And so I was flattered that you thought of me and, and, and talked with me about it, where, you know, so that helped ease that, oh, do I do this? Do I do this? Do I, do I leave that life behind that I've known so well and go into something completely different? Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it was a leap, um, but it was a leap that uh, was definitely a, um, a good move for me. Good. Well, it was for me, too. So, um, so does, so you, you made, you made, you went from TV and so everything's video almost uh, into marketing. Does, in marketing, does everything need to be video? No, not everything's, not, um, I know that, again, and I, and it, <clears throat> I'm a king of rambling, but. I, and I keep bringing back Steve Hartman. And again, if you don't know who Steve Hartman is, Google him, yeah. look him up, people. I'm telling you, you won't be disappointed. Mm -hmm. But um, going back, you know, I, I loved, uh, I lost my train of thought. What was your question? <laughs> does, I know. does everything need to be a video? No. There, you know, I know Steve Hartman has a, had, a, had a, a gig for a while with the news where everybody has a story. And that was an incredible thing. He threw a dart at the United <laughs> States. He would like, okay, I'm going to Utah, and then he'd go and find a phone book, which you can't find a phone book now, which is why the series ended. <laughs> uh, he'd go to flip through the phone book without looking, put his finger on a name, and then he'd go to their house, and he'd tell their story. And, um, and so everybody has a story, but not everything has to be told. <laughs> and um, not everything has to be video. Just because you have the ability, or in some cases the equipment, well, you know we've got it, so we got to use it. Right. You don't know. You, not everything has to be a video, um, but it's that you know again with the society and technology again coming back to bite us. Everybody's got a camera with them twenty four seven. It's it's in in fact the phone is no longer really a phone. And, and people don't even want to be called on that thing now. Right. You have people that, like, if you call my cell phone, I'm not going to answer it. 
you know, why don't they just carry a camera around? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, there's, you know, everybody uses their phone for everything, and then they shoot video vertically. But that's a whole other story. We'll put that um, resource in the show notes. Don't shoot right, vertically, vertically, please. Horizontal. If we can get a graphic up that shows that, there's all kinds of them, you know? <laughs> Yes. Uh, watch news one night with your TV sitting vertically. There you go. Yeah. Do that for a while. Um, you know, but with that technology, every, every so we oh, shoot a video. You know, Instagram. You know, I got you know everybody all that. Oh, here's my video story on Instagram, and here's and and I think that again, they're not bad. I mean, if if used creatively and with purpose, I think. They're ultimate tools. They're great tools. Again, just another tool in the bag to get your message out yeah. to people that you may not be able to reach in other modems or vehicles. Uh, but but I think, you know, when you dip to the well too much and just, you know, you see just people spraying video on their phones and, you know, and I got to make a video of this. I want to be viral. How many times have oh. you and I heard, I want to make a viral video. They don't care if it's good. They don't care if it teaches anybody anything i just want to make a viral video get people talking about me mm -hmm. you know and it's like i've not to become morbid but my news site is coming out um well then go kill somebody you'll be a viral video <laughs> yeah. because you're gonna have the news all over you amen and you will be viral in a heartbeat you know <sighs> again viral and all i kind of wish you know uh for me, because I'm old, I hear viral. It's like I gotta go to the doctor and get a sap. <laughs> and some of those viral videos give you that feeling. I just oh yeah, not, yeah. You know, I don't I don't know if that's marketing. I mean, you know, I don't know who said it, but any any uh, any bad publicity is publicity. Yeah, you know? right, right. Yeah. I, I don't know if I really agree with that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Um, it, that has yet to be determined yeah. really and you know some things can be an infographic yeah some things can be just oh, just yeah. a tweet a t doesn't have to tweet? be a video yeah I, yeah I mean and again uh, video wise and yeah you know, um I, you know i was into twitter for a while and then you know you're gonna get me on a subject i don't know if i want to go down that rabbit <laughs> hole with twitter right now I'm, I'm 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 really torn on twitter i i've i, I kind of feel like what it was and what it is now are two different things, yeah. and I kind of feel like, and I'll, I'll say it, and I'm going to irritate some people. It's given every village idiot a soapbox to stand on. Yeah, is basically what it's become. Oh yeah, and um, and there's just so much hate, and um, you know, you you coin, you know, you always felt that Twitter was like an ongoing discussion, mm -hmm. and uh, and now Twitter's just people yelling hateful things at each other. Yeah, and um. And so I'm, I'm really having a hard time with Twitter. And don't get me wrong, I'm just as good. I've been very sarcastic on Twitter myself, no. but I don't. But I don't think I've been hateful. Yeah. Um, and I and I I just see a lot of that. So, yeah. But not going back to your original again, King of Rambling. Um, going back, no, not everything has to be a video. Sometimes less is more. Yeah. And so a really nice, well designed infographic or like you said, tweet or, or just a nice still shot with, uh, you know, maybe a little text over it, just as good. You don't yeah. have to, you don't have to make, uh, you know, some epic, epic movie. Not always. All right, so this is my favorite part. You know what's coming. I know it's coming, and I, I was already, I was trying to gear up for it, <laughs> and I still am striking out. If you could, if, if somebody told you you can no longer tell stories. That you were done doing that, whether it's professionally or whatever. What would that last story look like for you, personally, professionally, whatever? What would your last story be that you would share? I did think about this, and I think, you know, if I had the chance, and and I have half of the chance now, is just to go back and tell my mom and dad's story. You know, my mom passed away in two thousand eleven, and. I think, you know, there's a she had an incredible story about me and it and it's not the story of me it, it's more the story of her how I was born in a snowstorm and in January and uh 
my dad had gotten both cars stuck in the driveway. My mom, having contraction, has to walk two miles to the nearest main road. No, no, it was about a mile to the nearest main road to where a waiting ambulance that couldn't get down her subdivision street was waiting for her. And um, consequently, I heard about this every birthday. Just an FYI. I've heard about it every birthday. And so my mom was walking in my dad's footsteps. And my dad is 6'2". My mom's 5'1". So the snow is up to her waist. They get out to this main road. They get into the ambulance. They're driving down the main road to the hospital. And the gas tank is ripped off of the ambulance by a snowdrift. They're dead. They're just there, dead in the water on this road. And... Um, and they can't even turn the ambulance on to keep the, the, the ambulance warm because it's got no gas. The, yeah. the gas tank's gone. Well, apparently there was a, a house on the corner where the, where the ambulance had, had stopped. And uh, she offered her home to my mom and dad. So they were in there for a while. And this is old school. This is back in the 60s. <laughs> and so um, a, an orange snowplow came. And uh, one of those big ones that you see, and here my mom is, you know, in contractions, crawling up into a snowplow to get to the hospital to have me. And then um, it got stuck. <laughs> and another snowplow had to come to get the first snowplow out. And the two of them were able to move the snow off to the side enough to get my mom to the hospital uh, her obstetrician came in via snowmobile, and um, and then and then so that whole story of having me, and then <clears throat> as it turned out, eighteen hours later, they discovered that I had a birth defect, and they gave me a fifty-fifty chance of surviving. So I ended up having to go into surgery, and I was at the hospital for a good month. And I didn't come home, and that whole story, um, my mom, and I would love, you know, I never got it recorded. But it'd be cool to have her tell that story, you know, mm -hmm. you know, so that would probably be because, you know, and I know it's about me, but to me, it's more about her and her strength to go through all of that for me. Yeah. So that's, that's my moment. Oh man, I love it. So. That's a good story. Yeah. Well, thanks for being on the Storytellers Network, man, and sharing your, your knowledge. Well, I still hope you have listeners after this. <laughs> oh, you, we, we will. So. Don't worry. Uh, so you're, you're on Twitter. Well, you know, sort it, of. It, it, I was waiting for this too, because. I, like many of your guests who are very successful, you know, they've got books, they've got podcasts of their yeah. own, they're constantly tweeting these nuggets of gold. I, I don't have anything. Don't look for me. I'm, I'm nobody. <laughs> I don't, I'm not politically correct. You know, I'm, I don't have anything. I'm not selling anything. <laughs> I don't own, I don't, uh, I don't have any real wisdom to impart on any of your your listeners, um, I call bullshit on that one. Uh, uh, I just, you know, I mean, I, I don't like. You know, don't look for me at a speaking engagement. Um, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I, I'm not that active on Twitter. I'm not that active on Instagram. Although uh, I do grill turkey burgers from time to time. <laughs> um, and, uh, but <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't have anything to sell. So. That's all right. For you, you're a, you're a helpful marketer. Well, you may not be a marketing technically anymore, but you're a helpful guy, uh, and you'll tweet about the Red Wings. So Red people Wings, can find yes. you there. Red Wings and Labrador <laughs> Retrievers. There you go. I mean, there you go. Awesome. Well, thanks, so. man. All right. Thank you so much to my guest and my friend, Bill Krupka. Be sure to visit him online. You can find his social media, uh, even though he's not selling anything, uh, in the show notes. And if you enjoyed the episode, please consider sharing it all over the place, all across that social media. Uh, it helps us reach new storytellers. And speaking of, another way to help us reach new storytellers is to consider leaving us a review. Look, if you like the show, uh, obviously it's free. Podcasts are free, right? Uh, so that uh, that price you pay could just be a review for me. So I appreciate that. In fact, here's one from, uh, from Peter of Chatbot Nation. Thanks so much, Peter, man. I appreciate you taking the time to say this. Uh, Peter says, telling stories is the most powerful way to be remembered, and it's been proven by neuroscience. Uh, I, I teach storytelling for selling all over the world and my storytelling blueprint formula. And I have to say, Dan has hit the nail on the head. I've been a lifelong student of telling stories from the great mentors like Joseph Campbell, Gandhi, and Abraham Lincoln. And if you want to get an inside look at how to craft the stories that get remembered and get results, listen to Dan Moyle of the Storytellers Network. 
High praise, Peter, man. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to get you on the show one of these days too. I know you've, you, again, you tell stories and, and you have been for a while. So thanks for that review. Uh, so yeah, leave us a review and, and, and uh, share with some friends. So there you go. That's it. Hey, until next time, here's to telling our stories and having those stories to tell. Cheers. Cheers.